it is my pleasure to introduce uh, my friend, Dave Adams. Dave has been model railroading for 65 years with his ON3 DNRGW, the Durland branch being layout number eight and the fourth narrow gauge layout. The narrow gauge bug bit in 1974 after seeing ON3 in operation at a model railroad club open house in the Bay Area. Somehow Dave convinced his bride that their honeymoon should be spent in Colorado discovering narrow gauge country. 47 years and numerous narrow gauge country vacations later, they're still married. Scratch and kit building was the perfect antidote to job stress, but with retirement, it is now more of a lifestyle. So Dave, I'm gonna turn it over to you and I look forward to your presentation. Okay, well, thank you, Mark. Let's see if I can get things launched here. As Mark said, I'm, I'm Dave Adams and I've been fooling around with model railroads for most of my life. Um, this is gonna be about the Durland branch, which is my most recent layout. And it's actually got several phases to it. One ran from 1977 to 1991. And the other uh, phase of it started in 1992 and is uh, still going. So we'll go ahead and proceed that. This is the uh, 1997 and 1991 version here. It was built in, started in an apartment that my wife and I had. This was in a second bedroom. And then when we bought a house, it was moved into the house and expanded. So what came out of the apartment was the part labeled Cascade Creek and the rest of it just sort of uh, grew in two thirds of a garage. And uh, the thing that's important about this particular railroad is, is the uh, idea of a two headed branch works so well. That was a theme I adopted for the uh, second, uh, second version of the railroad. And visiting a lot of other row N3 layouts in the area at the time is I would always come home and tell how much room the other guys had. And my wife finally suggested why don't we just add on to the house so you can build your train room? And so the black spike ceremony was uh, in 1991 and uh, this layout disappeared. Actually, it was put into a moving van and moved over to uh, one of the operating crew's uh, basements in, in Ben Lomond, California. So it, it still exists, it's being reconfigured. Um, we didn't get started on the uh, new railroad uh, immediately. We had some work to do, which was building a five inch scale uh, caboose, and you can. That's the framework that's in the in the garage that was cleared out where the old railroad used to sit, and it was converted back into a garage so my wife could park her car in there. Uh, the other half of the garage was occupied with this caboose project for oh about a year and some odd, and the picture on the right is is that caboose along with a five inch scale DNRGW caboose that was built by Charlie Trombley for the Redwood Valley Railroad up in Tilden Park above Berkeley. So the Durland branch is a freelance two-headed mountain branch line tying into the Rio Grande fourth division at Chama, New Mexico. It's O scale, quarter inch to oh, the foot, fuck. three foot track gauge. The period it represents uh, roughly 1920 to 1937 rolling stock, motive power and structures. However, the scenery is 1980s. It reflects a lot of the trips my wife and I made back there. And the operating schemes were more interesting in the 20s. So we've adopted that. The layout occupies a space of 18 and a half by 27 feet. It's partial double deck, walk around design. And we actually got started seriously on it in 1992. Track is all hand laid, code 183 and 70 pound rail, 40 inch minimum radius on the main tracks, 36 on some spur tracks. Control is CVP easy DCC with ops radio throttles. And the decoders I've standardized on sound tracks just to avoid too much uh, confusion and frustration. So this is the uh, lower level of, of the current railroad. Um, at that time, I was doing a lot of drafting. And um, so I, I chose to uh, draft rather than learn how to do CAD. So apologize for the crudeness of this, but that's it. This is all one level. This is all at uh, a height of uh, 41 and a half inches rail height off the floor. and. You can see Chama is featured here along with something called Navajo over on the right. And then if we take a look around here, this is all staging and this represents Alamosa and Durango. 
the upper deck take, took off at a place called Grant Line Junction and comes up through Cresco. We've rearranged geography here. We're going through Toltec on here. We're climbing along the High Line and we come into Corumba. And Corumba was really what I wanted Coombers to be, but it didn't fit, so it's Corumba. Uh, we won't go from Corumba up a 1% grade up to Fritz Park, and then we drop down a 4% grade into Durland, which was salvaged from the original layout. Uh, folks are always wondering, you know, well, how do you, how did you build this thing? So this is one of the drawings I did at the time uh, when we got the layout construction started. And this basically shows two by twos that are lag screwed to the wall. They're braced from below with uh, another two by two held in place with, a, with some gussets at the bottom. And we're using one by twos for most of the framing on this because the deck work needed to be thin. You'll see why later. These are a couple of photos from the early construction here. Um, the bad news is, is everybody except myself for this is passed on. They were all former members of the operating crew. In the upper left here, you can see the plate rail that's above. This plate rail basically has a dado on the bottom of it, for which masonite backdrop was forced up into, and that keeps it in the line. And then it was screwed to the two by twos, and then things finished with drywall mud and everything else. Uh, you can see the lower deck down here, upper deck going in. Uh, over on the right, this is my good friend, Dick Lucas, uh, who basically scratch built a modern ma model masterpieces turntable for me. And this is installing it at the time. This is another good friend, Jim Holmes. And here he's basically pulling some ground wires around here. You can see at this point, we've got the fascia on. When we added fascia to this rickety looking, really narrow bench work up here, this thing just stiffened up like a, like a drum. And uh, we haven't had a problem with it since. You can see it's still DC control as evidenced by the rotary knobs and everything else. And this right here is the big turn back loop that uh, gains elevation uh, from Cresco headed up to uh, to Corumba. In the center here is a one inch scale mock-up. And I know this was talked about a few uh, layout tours ago of how invaluable these are, and they really are. If you haven't built one of these, you really need to. When you enter the layout room, this is what you see when you look to your left. Um, what you see down here is the dispatcher's desk. Above it is Durland as saves from the original railroad. Over on the right are the model building benches. Above it is the staging yard I was uh, talking about. And above this is the town of Flint. And against the back wall is Navajo. And up above it, the climb out of Durland up to uh, Fritz Park. Again, at the end of the peninsula, we walk around that. We can see Navajo to the left, Fritz Park up above to the left. Uh, this right here is the west part of uh, my trauma scene. And above it is Fritz Park. And this is just the climb up to the grade to uh, Caramba coming around on the right. Looking down the aisle from that end of the peninsula here, uh, we've got Fritz Park again up on the left, Chama on the lower left, Cresco and the High Line on the right. And at the far end on the lower level is Grant Line Junction and above it is Caramba. And we're gonna start the tour in Chama here. And I won't, this, this structure is scratch built. It's uh, built out of styrene. The shingles are uh, Crystal River and the uh, decking and wood and everything is uh, home cut uh, sugar pine on a uh, on my table saw. And this, this building has a, an interior for the office, the waiting room, the agent's quarters and the, train, and the trainman's lobby. This is headed eastward into uh, into Chama. Um, the stock pens are all scratch built. Those were built from uh, a whole bunch of dimensions I took in the uh, early 70s, early 80s, uh, before the friends had started to rebuild the structure. And so this kind of represents what the last of the Rio Grande had there. If we continue on down into Chama here, this is a track scale house. Uh, that's styrene again, as I Measured that up, made drawings for it, and uh, scratch built the uh, the building in the in the outhouse uh, again out of styrene. On the right, we're looking down the length of the oil house and the long wall of the uh, Chama Roundhouse. So these are the Chama Depot grounds. On the left is there were a number of incarnations here that uh, that the railroad had had over the years. 
And I decided to like this, which was a two stall outhouse along with fire hose. Uh, when you take a look at the end of the building here is you're gonna see the fire bucket. You're gonna see, or the fire barrel, you'll see two fire buckets. Those fire buckets have round bottoms. And the reason a fire bucket had a round bottom is people were not inclined to steal them. Who wants a bucket to when you put it on the ground, it falls over and doesn't hold anything. So that's uh, where fire buckets came from and uh, why they were used. Moving on, this is the uh, four of the stalls of the uh, Chama Roundhouse. Uh, again, this building is scratch built, uh, has a complete interior machine shop, we'll see you later. Uh, and it, this was a COVID-19 project. I uh, had, had lived with a mock-up for, I don't know, close to 20 years, and I thought it was time I actually built a structure that needed to go there. So these are just a couple of pictures taken through some of the windows here. Uh, upper left is the boiler room. I chose to model it with all three boilers because that was what was on the 1919 ICC inventory of American railroads at the time they did that. The lower left shows the two circular forges that they had in there in the blacksmith shop. And it also shows the uh, boiler front of the consolidation boiler that stuck into the blacksmith shop and the exhaust from that boiler was then plumbed up and then piped back through the brick wall into a plenum on the other side. We'll see that in a little bit. And on the right side, this is just looking at uh, three windows into the machine shop that's got the overhead uh, uh, belt system. This right here is a picture of the uh, shops portion of the, of the roundhouse. And in the upper left is the uh, boiler room with the uh, three boilers in it as I modeled it. The lower left is the blacksmith shop, and uh, the center portion of it is the machine shop. So this is looking at the other end of uh, of the Chama Depot here. We've got a couple of uh, trains. Actually, this is just pulled into town behind S42, and it's going to uh, cut loose, pull forward, and 25 is going to cross over and tie in behind it, and then these two guys are going to boost that train up the hill. Looking further down into, into Chama here, was we've got the uh, Chama Sand House, which is a modified San Juan engineering kit. And I, I backdated this, so it's got the, actually the, the operating and telescoping uh, sand delivery spout as opposed to the rubber hose. The uh, telescoping spout disappeared in a horrible accident uh, one year and was just replaced with something that wasn't going to get ripped off. The uh, Chama Coaling Tower there is an old Hansel E. Main kit. These were primarily home cut uh, wood that he, he provided along with instructions, turn brass parts, and an awful lot of uh, cardboard. Uh, I replaced all of the cardboard with at that time with Glencraft and other and uh, other other scale lumber and rebuilt it. And then when Grantline came out with their uh, detailing kit for the uh, San Juan engineering version of, of the Chama Coaling Tower. I basically rebuilt everything, including the uh, delivery pit and that that's styrene and grant line parts. And down to the right, you can see the ash pit. The ash pit is again, based on original measurements that were that was there when we were back there in 1976 and 77 and uh, uh, features that. So this is as the, the railroad had it at that time. This is the Chama tank. It's a modified Crystal River kit. It's got operating spouts and sound. And this right here is, a, is an anachronism. And this is the Chama oil loading dock, but I like the Chama oil loading dock. And so I built this from, a, at that time it was a Chama shops kit, uh, modified based on a bunch of dimensions I'd taken when I was back there measuring things. And because I didn't have room for both tracks is the second track is simulated with photographs of model tank cars. This right here is uh, heading out of town toward Grant Line Junction at the far, far east of uh, of um, Chama. That's a York structure on the left. Uh, the house was built by Jerry Merker, a friend of mine, and the flat car and flanger are San Juan Car Company kits. And the shovel is a Durango press kit that was built by uh, by Ken Kukuk. Here we are passing through Grant Line Junction. Uh, again, we've got RGS 42 and 25. 
both those engines were outshot by uh, my good friend Ken Kukup. And here we've got a, uh, a rail fan basically uh, taking a couple of photographs of the thing going through the junction. Exiting the junction as we're now headed into East Cresco Switch. And uh, for reasons unknown to only the builder is, that tunnel portal is actually the, uh, the uh, mud tunnel cribbing and everything. And it really wasn't, didn't need it to be used in all that rock, but I liked it anyway, so we did it. Now we're headed up toward, uh, uh, through the other end of Cresco here, and then we've got the Cresco station sign. We've got the, uh, the phone booth there, which again was measured up and then scratch built. Um, and we're uh, headed, uh, headed up toward the tank. Here's this same train. We're working to a stop at Cresco. Water stop here is again, all my tanks have spout animation and sound. Sound is usually to, is used to time how long you're gonna wait. And here we are, we're working up on the high line. The Rio Grande had some interesting trestles, but they weren't half as neat as the RGS. So my high line consists pretty much of RGS side hill trestles. Again, these are all scratch built. Now we'll bounce up to Durland and see what the tour looks like from that end. So this is the long view. This is pretty much all there is to Durland on that. It's the it's the depot. It's a couple of tracks, a uh, three-way switch leading to a turntable and a, and a crossover. And on the back side of the depot is uh, we've got some industries. This is another look at some of the industries along that back track we just looked at. We've got a coal dealer here. Again, that's scratch built. Uh, that was built from a bunch of dimensions I took off of a coal shed that used to be in Ananito. Uh, the Durlin Oil Company was built from an article in the Narrow Gauge and Short Line Gazette. And the uh, stock chutes on the right, well, those are the cattle chutes that were at, uh, in, the, in the, at the part of the Chama stock pen grouping. The big industry up um, in Durland is uh, the Homestake Mine Company. It's the big shipper. And this is a modified model masterpieces kit. And this is what I made up of what basically feeds that, uh, feeds that uh, mill over there. And this is, this is the mining complex. We've got the tailing track coming out to the right. We've got a uh, trestle over the, over the railroad that's uh, Dumping the uh, ore down into the uh, down into the processing plant over there, and you can see the railroad uh, comes into town, skirting below all of this stuff. So this is now a picture of uh, working upside uh, up out of Durland. This is on a four percent grade, and uh, this is train number one twenty three, and he's working up through uh, through Resin Creek. Uh, the Resin Creek structure was again scratch built, and that was from field dimensions I took of the two remaining bins that, that uh, used to exist in the very early 80s uh, in various states of decay uh, on the RGS. And I, I kind of built a composite of them here. You admit that, gentlemen? Okay, now we're, we've come up the grade and we're now entering the east switch at Fritz Park. And at Fritz Park, again, big shipper up here during the stock rush at any rate, and you can see we model fall colors so we can run stock rushes, are two double tech stock chutes. Again, these are the same stock chutes that were at Chama, so we've built all of these things twice. And as we come up, this uh, was slide I think was shown in, a, in the pre-show, but this is the truck dump, scratch built from Cliff Clamp drawings of an ore bin that used to exist which was a truckload bin in Silverton. And the Mack truck is a kit bash of the CHB uh, uh, Mack truck kit. This is a west switch coming out of Fritz Park here. And uh, by bad planning, the summit of the railroad just happens to be about the point where that switch frog is. Interesting enough, we do not, do not have any deal around once there. And this is just another picture just showing a lot, I have a lot of small bridges on the railroad because when you go out and you walk the right of way, that's what you see, a lot of small bridges, a lot of culverts. This is this is uh, the top of the grade. This is Caramba. And you can see the passenger train has basically made it down grade and is uh, pulling into the depot there. On the left is uh, styrene, built out of styrene, again, scratch built 
structure of the uh, section house that's up there. Uh, on the right is a San Juan engineering kit that was built by, by my good friend, Dick Lucas. And the other small outbuildings were, uh, were scaled from uh, drawings and uh, photographs and uh, again, scratch built. Hey, this is uh, train number 123 and he's drifting ground grade out of Corumba toward Toltec tunnel. And this is just the uh, one of the side hill trestles along the uh, along the line there. Okay, this is the uh, stock train that's finally made it uphill. Uh, 25 has been cut out and he's been turned on the Y and is going to be headed downhill. Meanwhile, 42 is heading upgrade toward Fritz Park. Meanwhile, we'll go back at Caramba here. Another train basically came uphill and this is a mixed train and it uh, is pulls up. It basically drops its helper on the top. You can see the helper is backed into this into this leg of the Y here. And because it's only a short distance is this train basically shoves back into the town of Flint. When he's clear, as you can see in the bottom picture here, 361 is just basically cleared 456. He's going to finish his shove back into Flint. 456 will finish turning on the Y back up to the Chamba Depot for orders and then head down grade. Okay, so why aren't you not advancing slide? Okay, here we are. So this is Flint. Uh, Flint turns out to be a uh, scratch built model from photographs of the uh, boxcar depot that was Odoe on the Santa Fe branch. And I chose this just simply because you've got to do a lot of reaching into the scene in order to switch cars here at the uh, coal breaker. And a depot of any size was going to prohibit that from happening and probably get busted up. So we went with a low profile building on this. This is the, uh, again, the town of Flint here. Um, the structure on the right is scratch built. That was built for me by uh, Jim Vale. Uh, next to it is a modified Banda kit, which was, I think, the Dallas Hotel. Uh, next to that is a uh, modified design tech uh, store that uh, was built by my good friend Ken Kukuk. And beyond that are the uh, York Sonora stores uh, that have been <clears throat> rebuilt and, and named. And beyond that is a uh, downtown deco flat that uh, when I got around to it, I couldn't use it as a flat. So I had to scratch build and carve two brick walls in order to make it a 3D structure. And at the far end of that is another modified design tech kit. So this is kind of what it looks like. And this is the whole length of Flint, uh, pretty much. The uh, caboose was uh, was built from a uh, slim gauge productions kit. And the uh, combine here was basically built by my good friend, Dave Klum. And uh, he built that from San Juan car, uh, car Company kit. This right here is just another picture so we could show off Jim Vale's sheep dip bar. Turns out Jim Vale owns just about everything in this town. And uh, this is just another way to uh, show that. Jim was also fam famous for Jack Daniels. And so that's what he proudly pour pours in his establishment here. Another end of uh, Flint, uh, basically so you can see the signage on the, uh, on, on the buildings. And again, <laughs> this town has a lot of, uh, I'm gonna say inside jokes in it. The doctor's office is named after a good friend of mine who's since deceased, and uh, it's the Jack Fishburne Memorial Burn Ward. And Vale's General Store down the street there basically sells buckets of water and hot glue guns. So you can kind of understand what the connection might be. Uh, next to that is Jim Vale's Emporium and Sign Shop. Uh, sign Shop, why his layout was literally covered with signs. And next to that is Mike Schwab's restaurant, Simply Fine Eats. And then we've got the Third National Bank. These are the last guys in town to establish a bank. This right here is the Hindley Rock Coal Company. Uh, this actually existed on the uh, layout that was in the two thirds of the garage before we expanded it, except it existed as a matter of, of a foam core structure only. Um, after getting it into Flint is we basically uh, covered it with a whole bunch of uh, home cut lumber, built a bunch of retaining walls, and turned this into an enterprise for the railroad to uh, uh, run coal trains from. This right here is another scratch built structure, and this is the powerhouse 
this is based on photographs uh, out of the mineral belt and other books of the uh, facilities that were uh, up there at uh, Crested, above Crested Butte. Another view of that, uh, again, the Stiff Lake Derrick was uh, built as a means of getting stuff from the lower tracks up to the powerhouse and into the uh, into the mining complex. Um, the powerhouse has an interior, including bricked-in uh, stationary boilers, uh, steam engine, uh, dynamo, uh, everything you basically would need to do that in an, in an air pump. And back down grade, this is uh, engine 456, which we saw getting ready to turn on the Y earlier, and he's headed down grade out of uh, out of Toltec Tunnel and is passing the Garfield Monument. So at this point, we're going to take a tour downstairs down to staging, which is below Flint. And you can see the schematic down below here. Uh, you can see there's a loop, and that comes around into a loop, and that's basically for reversing or reverting trains. So we use that loop regardless of whether they're coming in from uh, uh, Navajo or whether they're coming in from Chama. That same loop will get the train headed back in the right direction. Uh, the uh, three stub yard there it was built to add more staging as we wanted to add expand operations. The Caljader Miles Davis, uh, again, that is an HO scale model. Uh, Jim Vale built that uh, because he used to frequent the Blackhawk Jazz Club up in San Francisco. And he built that. And he, every time you went over to his house and you looked at the town, you would find out that Jim had changed out the marquee. He had different headliners for every, uh, every, uh, every session over there. Down below, this is just looking along the, uh, the uh, staging area here. Uh, toward uh, toward the toward Chama, and down at the bottom here, you can kind of see where staging exits into the visible scene here at the west uh, at the west end of, uh, of of Chama there. And what good are friends if they uh, don't surprise you occasionally, or a lot, as the case may be? This is a car that was a collaboration between Jim Vale and Dave Grant, and uh, Jim found a. A supplier of uh, private label cars on on the internet, and he ordered it up. And you can see that in the photograph down here on the right. He put that on a scanner. He scanned this. Dave Grant was had built a, a wood refrigerator car, but he had never finished it. So he and Jim got together. Jim printed the decals. And so what I've got now is an ON3 ankle biter beer car. And this thing provides a lot of beer up to Flint. Provides a lot of beer up to. Uh, up to Durland and uh, places in between. Take a quick look at the dispatcher's desk um, and the phones. You'll notice the telegraph sounders in here. This is another scratch building project I got involved in, uh, just simply because a friend of mine came up with a uh, an Arduino-based skit that could transmit railroad morse to stations in your station call letters. And it turns out, once I installed that, the buzzers that I'd previously used were irritating to my wife at the other end of the house. And she said, you've got to take this out. And so I thought, well, I didn't want to do that. So I thought, well, suppose I did something that made less noise, like a telegraph sounder. And so I found online a uh, article from the 1870s, and, and it was for intended to teach Young men, the art of machining. And one of the things was in there was construction of a telegraph sounder. And so I basically read that article. I modified it in order to uh, fit modern day materials and things that I could get a hold of. And uh, that, that's what we've got here. So you can see that over here. We've got the gate arm phone for the dispatcher. We've got a telegraph sounder. We've got the Prince Albert can. And I can tell you these things really do work. They amplify the sound coming off of that anvil. And above it is the uh, set of train procedure uh, folders that the crew carries with them to tell them what uh, what they've got to accomplish on the run. And over on the right here is just a typical phone setup, again with a telegraph sounder. We have not had a marital complaint about the telegraph system uh, since it was installed. Another thing I'll quickly cover here is something I almost didn't do, which was put in a lift out. Everybody hates them, I hate them, they're no fun. But John Parker convinced me I really needed one because I was going to watch, want to watch trains 
go around and around and just drink a cocktail every once in a while. Um, so originally the railroad was going to have shotgun staging under Durlin. And so when I put in the lift out, I thought, well, I don't need to do shotgun staging anymore. We can just bring it across the lift out here and we can do the staging over on the other side under Durlin. So this been problematic. We had cables and plugs and cords. And as technology went on, as I got to the point where um, I made it so it's self-aligning, it basically drops in at one end, self-aligns with this V-block at the other end. Electrical contact is automatically made with, a, with these contacts here that, uh, again, Jim Vale found online and used on his railroad. And then the last thing I did is I basically put in a detector that would let me know when the bridge was in or out. If the bridge is out, there's this steel rod that pokes up through the uh, through the roadbed here that will basically stop anything dead in its tracks. Once I had this, it was uh, this whole uh, business of the lift out was far less threatening. So the lift out goes in if a train needs to cross it. Otherwise, it's out. And so you can see that here. Here's the one end where you align this in first. The pin is up because the bridge is out. The uh, micro switch uh, detects it over there on the left. Uh, you can see on the right side, the counterpart here, the same bunch of stuff on that. And uh, here you can see it with the bridge in. Both safety pins are down and we're free to go. And why do all of this? Well, I really like operations. And uh, these pictures were taken actually over the... Uh, Thanksgiving holiday weekend when we have a uh, um, probably the last uh, operating session of the year on a Durlin branch and uh, we invite everybody for lunch and we just have a good time. So these pictures were taken and I've got to thank my good friend uh, Jonathan Sauer for uh, not only doing a wonderful job of being the uh, yard master that day in Chama, but also for having the time to take a couple of pictures showing uh, a good time being had by all. And the other, other thing is, is even with people changes, you know, it's really the crew that makes this whole hobby worthwhile. And by the crew, I include, you know, everybody in the model railroad and hobby. You can see it's changed in 2018. And unfortunately, there are several people in that, that photograph that are no longer with us. The more recent photograph is on the right. And I've taken the liberty of taking a picture of, of uh, that Jonathan provided and sticking him in at the bottom because he was the guy that took this picture for us at the uh, at the uh, gathering. So that's it. I appreciate your your time and attention, and I guess we can open this up for uh, for questions here. Thanks Thank very you, much, Dave. Dave. Robin, are you going to do the questions? Yeah, uh, there's uh, a few questions here. Actually, Greg Wright, who is one of our guys up here in the Pacific Northwest, um, he says, absolutely correct on the fire buckets. Uh, the rarely model, good work, Greg. You know, the curvy bottoms, the fire buckets. So, yeah, that's kind of cool. Um, uh, Bill Hobbs says, can't remember when he last saw the layout, but it's certainly changed a lot. And um, you missed a chance to have a branch of the fifth third bank, a real bank name. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, uh, sorry, um, uh, our Kerr says, Dave, great presentation and layout. Thank you for sharing. Jim Spice said the same thing. Great looking layout, as does Steve Hollenbach. And uh, Jonathan Stower, a great presentation on the lift out. What drives the pin? I think you have little servos driving the pin. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, so, okay, so what drives yeah. the uh, what drives the pin is, uh, is our little servos. And those are driven by uh, uh, just a, a pretty dumb uh, servo driver. And what I ended up building was a, uh, well, it's, if you know how steam locomotive works with the, with a wrist pin and the crosshead guides and everything, that's essentially what's under there. And so the, uh, so the servo just basically drives that little crank and that shoves the pin up and down. It's nice and simple. I like it. Um, Mark Lewis says, Dave, an amazing model railroad. Thanks for a great tour. And Jim Brown, what a lovely layout. Thanks for sharing, Dave. And I would agree. <laughs> 